I am thrilled to be on this panel because I don't think I've ever been the youngest person on a panel before. It's <laughs> very exciting. I'm thrilled to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so are we. Yeah. Uh, Donna, why don't I start out, just tell us how this project came about. Um, it started in the, a workshop at the Directors Guild with Chuck Workman. It was called Filmmaking, Personal Filmmaking for Professionals. And um, I went to this seminar and we thought it would be one day, there were 60 people, and then he said, no, we'll be there for about eight months making <laughs> making a film and by the time we finished with that workshop there were only 12 of us had made a film and I approached the men um, really I appro approached them originally through my father and there was some reluctance we felt because the environment didn't seem to be conducive to filming and of course once we asked Factors was great and the men were wonderful and I knew some of them and then we started filming and um, we, we, we filmed one lunch and we asked Asked them to come back for a second lunch and wear the same clothes, which they were nice enough to to do. Uh, there they were was the a, only clothes that we had. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to find the theme, and as I began interviewing each of the men, I learned that the theme of friendship was was, was primary, and that the theme of um, sharing was really great. It sustained them and their careers and their continuing ideas. So it, it was just a natural and, uh, uh, you know, interviewing each of them, I got to learn about their careers. And I think that's what tells the story as well. So it took us a year and a half, but glad they're here and I'm glad we were able to do it. We're that's, glad that's we're the here long too. Story. <laughs> um, I'm interested, you know, these days, if you go on IMDb and someone has like a screen full of credits, it's like, wow, you know, a substantial career. You guys, it's scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. It's amazing the, the bulk of your career and the longevity. I'm just curious what you feel has kept you going, what sustained you. Deep breaths. <laughs> Deep breathing has worked for me. No, I do it for money. <laughs> Do you take some deep breaths with that? How do you like it so far? I like you. No, <laughs> no. One, of, one, of, one of the things I'd like, to, I'd like to say is that when you see the credits today, you see 24 producers on the show. You see executive producers, sub-executive producers, associate producers who are related to these executive producers. They, we used to have one producer on the show. Well, nowadays, the supervising producer is mainly in charge of getting coffee for the producers. Can so I tell you something? That's the way it should be. <laughs> By the way, you took yours black with one sugar, right? <laughs> Same as you. <laughs> now, Ben, you're still writing, right? Yes, it's a curse. I can't stop. <laughs> what are you working on? What are you doing? I just finished a screenplay. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are there any agents in the... He needs an agent desperately. He me, we've been talking about his agent. He didn't have one. Do you hear he, an echo here? <laughs> I'm trying to help you. You don't speak loud enough. I do want an agent. It's crazy. You know, my agent did a typical agent thing. He died without my permission. He... And, uh, but he died long before he represented him. <laughs> Thank you, folks. I believe that concludes my... <laughs> let me talk. Yeah, I mean, what the hell? Oh, I'll, let, I'll let you talk. Go ahead. <laughs> I do that. It doesn't matter. Um, I started writing 80 years ago when I was 11. And I was just... Uh, I didn't have a typewriter. Who knew about typewriters, you know? And I wanted, I didn't want, I would say. You don't know how to use a microphone. Get your mouth up close so that they can't hear you. I want to make a citizen's arrest. <laughs> Stop this. No, no. I wasn't the first I mean, one. Somebody said, get him closer to the microphone. And I said, he's right. <laughs> I'm too close to you. That's the problem. <laughs> I now think we do. have a new show, uh, <laughs> The Cocker and the Wise-Ass. I, I got, I got, <laughs> <geez. laughs> 
<laughs> See, everybody has to be sitting up high. I, I sit here low, and because I'm, I'm, I'm successful and, and, and feeling very confident about it. They're up there trying to be recognized. <laughs> I'm already tired of my story. <laughs> and I, I haven't even told it. This is the funniest goddamn... <laughs> Where was I? It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> anyway, I started writing when I was a kid. And I'd write stories and send them away to magazines. <laughs> and I didn't want them to know that I was a kid. So I took great pains with my penmanship. But they still would turn me down, you know. But I did. I started when I was 11. Then after, when I was in the service, I did my... 35 missions, I was a, a navigator and uh, in the 8th Air Force. When they finished, if you were alive after 35 missions, they didn't know what to do with navigators. So they sent us all to uh, Houston, Texas. And in Texas, I was bored. So I sat down, I wrote a story and sent it off to Esquire. And uh, a very nice lady, the editor, wrote me a letter. She said, we've almost bought this. It's not right for Esquire. But she recommended an, an, an editor of another magazine and said, send it to her. I've told her about you. So I kept sending it to various magazines. Everybody kind of liked it, didn't publish it. But 10 years later, I sold it as my first screenplay. You know, it was called The Elephant Who Couldn't Remember, about uh, a misunderstood elephant that, who came to the America. You only seen this was, movie? Yeah. Pardon? Ben. Didn't you see the movie? No. Uh, is, is this a pitch? <laughs> Anybody I, here? <laughs> Snakes on a plane. How about that? This is a tough room to play. I got to I got to anyway, a repeat they, for the West Coast. They bought it years later. And I've been writing ever since. I did uh, the Perry Mason pilot, the Thin Man pilot, co-created uh, tell us Silver about Spoons. The, tell us about the pilots you didn't sell. I uh, co disregard I uh, <laughs> There were a lot of those. Uh, Co-developed Facts of Life. Had six movies. My first credit was Our Man Flint. I've had plays on Broadway, off Broadway, translated in various languages. I love, I love to write. I just, that's my story. Good. That was part of my story. Someday you'll come to my house and... <laughs> It's a mini-series that starts on HBO next Tuesday. <laughs> Anybody want to ask any questions? We'd love to answer them. Just yeah. raise your hand. Yeah, right Go ahead. Back yes, I see a hand back there. Are you guys still meeting for lunch? We met this afternoon for As lunch. As a matter of fact, we met today. At lunch. With Sid Caesar. Sid Caesar, who is uh, uh, wheelchaired, uh, but not as voluble as I am, or loud or noisy. <laughs> Or, or as funny today, he was much funnier then. He was. But he, uh, tell you the truth about Sid, as, as much as he's incommunicative most of the time, he wouldn't miss this lunch for anything. This is the highlight of his time. He would not miss it. And it makes we, him live today. And really, we love having him there. And when he walks in the room, we all say, "The king is here," because we think he is the king of comedy, and and he loves it. Well, the twelve years he was up there. Uh, on top, uh, where, where the uh, it, it was, it brought it brought television comedy to its peak. Since then. <laughs>
you're looking at some men who've been working, John's younger, but the work has sustained them. They've been at it for 50, 60, 70 years, and nobody gets a career like that anymore. And that's what's so unique for me with the work and their continuing work. And if you would like to know a little bit more about what each of them is doing, you know, Maddie has a book. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things that each of them are, uh, are doing and that are very inspiring for all of us in this room. So I'd, I'd be glad to hear a little bit more about that, but I'm kind of enjoying this little uh, uh, repartee here with the uh, Rocky and Ben. Winkle, here we have. But, but, yeah, maybe we should just stick with all the. Let me tell you that the stars. lunch. This is a replica of the lunch. <laughs> the lunch starts. Somebody talks. Rocky interrupts. <laughs> I know. Ben no, no. gets very. He gets his nose out of joint. He starts going after Rocky, and the rest of us just sit and listen. They better be careful because they were. They they think the name Rocky means tough, and they're scared to death out of me. They really are. Uh, I know. I know. John is. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Maddie, John, Maddie, that's Maddie, just John. Well, you got to have one opponent, you know. Uh, uh, as as uh, uh, as Mr. Star, as Mr. Star has said, uh, he writes every day. I write every day. I write with my wife, who writes every day, uh, and has done it uh, for an age and a half. Uh, between us, how many years have we been married? Seven. Seven years. Seven, seven, seven happy, happy years. years. They're not consecutive, <laughs> but they were seven happy years. Seven out of sixty-four ain't bad. No, we're 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 straight. We're stri they, they say people don't have long lives, ma long marriages in in this in this town. He's been married sixty sixty four sixty four pushing sixty five. We've been sixty four. Pushing 65. Sid Caesar was 65, and his wife passed away. Uh, Arthur, Arthur Hiller, how many years? Swap with me here. Yours is on. You're hot. Uh, you married about 63, four, 64 years, right? We're also married 64 years. 64 years also. Yeah, that's a lucky number. Who has a question? Well, I really don't have a question. You mentioned Rocky and Bullwinkle. I'm the voice of Rocky. And Natasha, of course. But I've known being on the board of the Motion Picture Academy with Arthur Hiller. And he was so wonderful. And I just wondered how you got along with the comedy writers as a director. I got along very well with them because, how should I say, I pay attention to what they write. I think. I drop to my knees in front of the writers. Not in this town you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And uh, they sit in a darkened room somewhere and come up with an idea and then take it and create something from that and pretty soon there's a screenplay or a story, whatever it is. The rest of us, well I want to say, you know, I don't know quite how to say it, but have a pl fl floor plan to uh, to work from. It's just reminding me that the Writers Guild magazine once did a uh, a piece where they had two writers, two writer directors, and two directors just sitting and talking, and were asked questions and that. And when I said it's uh, you know, the rest of us have a floor plan. He jumped up screaming at me. That's not a floor plan, that's the movie. You know, and, and, and he came over and he was, he was choking me. <laughs> and Phil Robinson had to sort of pull him off me in that. I wish I had remembered a, a line, that I wish was mine, but that a director said once to a writer who spoke like that, and he said, well, if that's the movie, put it in the projector. <laughs> <laughs> Maddie, you, you just came back from a book tour, correct? Yes, I did. Tell us about it, and then you guys can interrupt. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've written a number of books. Uh, this last one's called uh, Fat, Drunk, and Stupid, which is a line from Animal House, which I produced. And uh, it's about the making of the movie. And I went on a, gosh, about four or five week book tour. 
I did 71 interviews. I lost eight pounds. <laughs> and uh, I'm one of the producers of uh, a musical version of Animal House as well. I'm working on uh, two, uh, two other. I'm pretty busy. The fact is, you, you do all that writing because you want to lose eight more pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm in fighting f form right now. That's good. Not with me. I think, as you may have learned from the movie, that uh, I'm very, very lucky and uh, to be able to be with these incredible legends and uh, these guys and these minds uh, is just a break that uh, I'll always be grateful for and uh, the work that Donna does to capture what goes on there and uh, you know, someone and Arthur who is a, a wonderful director and I always he's always so nice I always keep looking at him and I saying are you sure you're a director <laughs> you know? uh, I'll give I'll loan him this hat <laughs> I worked on a movie with Arthur and I've never worked with a director who had more respect for writers. I mean, he treasures the written word, and that is a marvelous uh, thing for a Can I add one thing about Arthur? No. We go back to Toronto many, many, many moons ago. And he, he mentioned in the film that, that we had this party, and you were leaving for California, and I was leaving for New York. I've known him for 50 years. Never used me in a picture. <laughs> And he's telling me why. <laughs> I don't even want sitting beside him. <laughs> Let me just give Great you friend. Mind. Maybe that's why we're still friends. <laughs> These luncheons are wonderful because you hear the way it, people interrupt each other, and they do all through luncheon. Nobody ever finishes a speech. But if I could come there, for example, and I have a story to tell, or something that I've written uh, and for all the monologues that I do in charity events, as soon as I finish telling the story, inevitably, somebody will say, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> it's Ben, does it? I swear it happened again today at lunch with he, Ben. He had a hat. I told the story, and he says, that's not the way it goes. He had I a said, hat. Ben, I wrote that story in 1960. It's not not the way it goes. I'll give you an example. Uh, I came. You, you, uh, were you there? That I told this, uh, this story about um, the, the, at Hillcrest. The women at the, uh, at the country club are always complaining about the meals. You, you can't go to a lunch without eight eight of them complaining. And the waiter walks over one day and he says, "Ladies, is anything all right?" <laughs> ben Starr says, "That's not the way it goes." Uh, how does it go, Ben? He says, is everything all right? I said, no, Ben, you don't understand. <laughs> you, it's, is anything all right? Because they're always, I can't win. That's the joke. <laughs> that's, that's not the way it goes. And today at lunch, what was this? You, again, you, you question. Emma, that story you just told was funny, but it's not true. <laughs> I never, never said what you said, but I enjoyed what you made up. <laughs> You, Rocky, mentioned that you wrote with your wife. Yes. Has a lady writer ever been invited to the lunch? One time. One time, my wife was invited. I have to tell you a story that happened in Palm Springs about, about two months ago. A guy named... <laughs> you don't want to hear... I'm going to tell the story. As <laughs> you, can, uh, you can use the language, Jim. It's okay. You're not going to lose the... Okay. Anyhow, this guy, he said... I think his name was Mendelssohn. I, I, he said he knew me, but I, I didn't know him. And uh, see, I'm speaking into the mic like you should have. <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, he said uh, there are some writers down here, and and would you like to come? There are about twenty of us down here that have been uh, writing in television. Uh, would you like to? Would you like to come? I said, Irma, I'd be happy to come. He says you can come, but but Irma can't come. And I said, well, why why can't Irma come? They said, well, some of the guys tell naughty stories, and some of the language is a little offensive. And so I said, Irma, Irma, here's the microphone. Oh, you might as well. All right. You know, I said, Irma, and they turned you down from having lunch with these people because they said the language was, was offensive and... And, and uh, she said... Catalogical. Let me finish. <laughs> we all know what catalogical. she said. Catalogical. No, you will know in a minute, you know. <laughs> you know. And she said... Uh, I said, what, what, what do you think? What should we tell them, Irma? She says, tell those cocksuckers to shut the <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> Well, uh, ben, ben told me that's not really how the story went. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah.
And that's and not the way it was right? Irma. Since I'm Tell him how it really went. <laughs> <laughs> Irma came to our luncheon once, too. One time. And we banned her after that. We never had Thank an off-color story at our lunches for 50 years until Irma came. That's <laughs> it. Is that right? She's proud of it, too. <laughs> Irma, stand up. Just let her be. Irma, Irma st she is standing up. Long, yes. Irma Kalish, longtime board member. Stand, stand up, Irma. Writer. Stand up. <laughs> Irma, stand up. I, I just have one remark to make. You heard the acronym that Hal Cantor said about these men at their luncheon. They're called the Romeos, the retired old men eating out. And I got to thinking about that because where there's Romeo, there's got to be Juliet, right? So what could we do with Juliet's? Jewish. And I thought of and thought, and I finally came up with it. And I thought, just us ladies immensely enjoying total solitude. <laughs> That's why we don't invite her to lunch. She's funnier than all of us put together. Still she sits I... back in the wings waiting. Just waiting, waiting for the opening, and then knocks you on your ass. Arthur has something. No, just but enough about your honeymoon. <laughs> Arthur? That's hey, you got to get lucky once in a while. You got lucky twice. <laughs> I think I'm the only person at the lunch who's not a writer. I've never you know, written anything or worked on sort of writing and that. And what I love about it is well, the camaraderie, of course, but the fact that I know sort of all the shows, I've seen the shows, but now to hear the people who who create them, who write them, who work on them, and uh, just to get the feel of the anecdotes of that time or, or wherever, that's... Well, you may not literally be a writer, but all of the people that are here, people with a sense of humor, Gary Owens is known as the great disc jockey and voice and all that. Gary Owens has written more humor than probably everybody in this room put together and all that. And uh, uh, everybody everybody here has done something. Um, Monty, you write, every time you were ad-libbing something on Let's Make a Deal, you were basically writing it on the spot. I did the show. Yeah. The show's on for 47 years now. That's not a bad check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it myself for the first 29 or 30 years before I hired other people to do it. And the whole, no script at all. No script at all. And that's the best writer of all. The man can get up and do a show without the words in front of him. It's not what goes on the paper, it's what comes out of the head that right. basically counts. Whether and then Ben would be, come alongside and say, no, that, that's, that's not the way it is. <laughs> he had a hat. <laughs> yeah. So is anything okay? Yeah, it's yeah. anything, you're all right. Other, any other question? Yeah. Donna, since this film was made, which apparently was in 2009, there's been a big change at the Motion Picture and Television Fund and the more affectionately known as the Motion Picture Home. I was wondering if you were planning to put a postscript into the credits that it reflects the fact that the home is open, that the long-term care unit is now full with, with 40 people and the historic mission has been restored. We could. And I have just come from the motion picture home after contributing to it for 50 years. I am moving into it uh, and uh, I, I, I've been there three, four days and I have found it wonderful. And everybody else in the place that I've spent. Is Irma moving in with you? I don't know. You know, you've, you've got to meet new people along the way. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, Rocky, why don't you introduce Nancy, your daughter, the uh, I will. I will the let me, may I do that? Would you? Uh, the the woman, the lady, uh, who was the prime mover of getting the motion picture home back into action is my daughter, Nancy. And when I say the prime mover, I mean she stood alone. She fought it. She was like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, I, except for the sheet. You know, Steve. you were mentioning 
You were mentioning the motion picture home, and I saw Mr. Ed with Alan Young. Yes, I worked right. with Alan Young, and he is now living at the home. Yes. And I yeah. visited him last week, and he's doing fine. At the motion, well, I, pic I, I, at the I, motion I, picture home? Yeah. Alan Young. The, when, I, when I was growing up, Alan Young was one of my heroes. He's from Canada originally, as you know. Yes, I know. His name was Angus. Did you know that? Back, he's from British Columbia. Everybody's named Angus there. Yeah, his name was Angus. <laughs> Listen, when you see Alan, would you please say hello for me, because I wrote 42 Mr. Ed shows, yes. and he was such a terrific guy. I really sure. loved him. We once did um, on the Mr. Ed show, we, I saw a master shot that I couldn't believe, but I was there and I saw it. Uh, the horse was in the stable, and that night, uh, Alan Young and his neighbor both got into trouble with their wives, and the wives made them sleep in the barn. <laughs> and uh, being the host, there was only one blanket and two couches. So Alan said to his neighbor, you sleep on that couch and you can have the blanket. I'll sleep on the other couch. Mr. Ed didn't like that neighbor and he was very upset. And this is the shot that I witnessed. The trainer, the horse's trainer said, Ed, when we say action, he's talking to a horse. He said, when we say action, I want you to go over to the neighbor's couch, take the blanket off, you know, and put it on Wilbur, then come back into your, your stable. I swear to God, they say action. <laughs> The fucking horse goes over to the guy, takes the blanket, puts it on Wilbur, and goes back into his stall. Oh, he that, missed his mark, now, though. That's a director. <laughs> that's why I used to, on the set once in a while, say to him, Ed, I know you can talk. Talk to me. You know. Listen, there's something I would like every one of you to do tomorrow. <laughs> and that is to call anybody you know in the business who hires writers and say to them, don't judge us by the lines on our faces, judge us by the lines on our pages. Uh, on that note, that's not the that's not the way it was written. <laughs> it's the way I made it up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a pretty good fundraiser. Would you chip in, please, and send your money over to this poor kid? Pass Can't a, get a oh, job. Pass a hat around. Yeah. Pass a hat. He right. had a hat. <laughs> Or, on that note, or was it he had a hat? No, I'm not sure. I put the right I, way. I he had a hat. No, I had anything a, okay? I, I want he to had a hat. I think we should close on a, on a yeah. funny note. And Monty told a joke recently that I really love about the two ladies who have lunch all the time. Would you tell everybody that oh, joke? Oh yeah, that's great. Like that's that great. Yes. I'll tell it, and Ben Starr will say that's not the way it goes. No, no, that's that's a good uh, one. <laughs> Two ladies, two girls went through school together, went through law school, became very prominent young lawyers. One was Catholic and one was Jewish. And they'd meet for lunch all the time, <clears throat> very close friends. And one day at lunch, the Jewish girl says to her Catholic friend, I, I, I really love you and I love everything about you, but your religion seems to stymie me. How do you believe all that dogma that, that we hear, the, the, the various stories, and the Catholic girls, it's like what? She says, well, like Jesus walked on water. How do you believe it? They say, well, the Catholic girl says, well, perhaps when he was walking, there was rocks there, and he was walking from one rock to the other, and he gave the appearance that he was walking on water. What else? She says, well, he turned water into wine. And you believe that? Well, it could have been that there were a few dregs left in the glass, and when you put water, and it came up pink and it gave the impression. And she said, well, while we're talking about that, what about you Jews and Moses parting the Red Sea? And the Jewish girl says, well, wasn't that something? Ah!
Thank you, you very you gotta much. You got to do it with a Jack Benny look. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, that's mine. You, wanna, you guys are so funny. Very funny. <laughs>